Well, Charles, I, I asked you, and it was a big ask, to select some of your favourite photographs through the years. And I, I think, a, a, and the selection you've sent me is just awesome. And it's love to begin, actually, with um, basically the order you sent them in, I think, works quite well. And the first shot is of a certain Mr. E. And I guess that says it all, doesn't it? <laughs> well, who was it? What was that? Was that a posed shot or what? Or was that real? No, it's not posed. Uh, it was in Brazil in 2009. Um, it, it, he was chatting to Nelson Piquet, and I can't remember who came up behind me, but that was Bernie's re response. Wow. And uh, it's just, like you say, it's a kind of classic Bernie Ecclestone picture, really. You know, he was, um, he certainly wasn't a dull character. And probably, probably behind Lewis, I would say that he causes the biggest stir, you know, or caused the biggest stir when he came into the paddock um, in terms of photographers trying to get a shot, you know, you, um, you know, Alonso and Vettel are big characters, but Bernie, there was always something happening around Bernie, you know, and, and he was good, he was good for pictures. Um, so yeah, that was, that was... Charles, for how long have you been, sorry, for, for how long have you been a professional photographer going to Formula One races? Uh, I started Formula One in 1995. I started at LAT in 1988. Um, but you kind of, it's a bit like coming up as a driver. You kind of start as the darkroom scumbag and, uh, you, you know, and you, and you, and you start doing, um, Formula Three and touring cars and then someone might move on and you get a chance doing, you know, Formula One and then you kind of move up the ladder really you know but it was 95 was my first proper season so give or take 25 years you've been around this is this is the build-up to this question does bernie if you saw bernie now would he know your name i would have thought so i mean but one of one of my favorite like assignments that i've done would be uh it was lunch with bernie and uh it was in kensington and um, it was just a, a journalist interviewing him and I was there to take photographs. Um, I mean, we didn't get off to a great start because I, I kind of turned up in Kensington and uh, it, he came out about 45 minutes later and we went off down the corridor and he turned around and saw me with my camera bag and he said, um, where do you think you're going with that? And I said, well, I'm, I'm doing the pictures. And he said, well, you can leave that at reception. And I, I just assumed that he was joking because that, that was why I was there. So I just carried on walking, and he turned around again, and he and he was like, "Did you not hear me, boy? You know." So, um, so I left it at reception. And I thought, "Well, this is going to be interesting, you know." And uh, so we went and had we had lunch and uh, had a beer with him, and um, we basically were just chatting about uh, sort of 1980s Formula One, you know. And I, and I was I was kind of like saying, "You know, it's a shame that we can't have big, powerful cars that are spectacular, you know, like they were then." And, and he said, "Well, I completely agree with you, boy." Um, and I sort of said, well, surely if anyone can make it happen, you can, you know. Um, and then we went back to his office and I did a few shots of him on his, at his desk. Um, and I, I was getting quite kind of familiar with him really by the end, you know. And I, I kind of said, um, you know, surely a man in your, with, with all your power and money, you know, you, you could kind of, you could almost change the world single-handedly. And, and he said, well, he said, he said, he said the wife's saving some bears in Russia or something, you know. And as I left the room, he kind of patted me on, on the back, and he, he sort of said, "Well, you're not, you're not a bad lad, really, are you?" So I think he kind of warmed to me a little bit. But um, it was, it was a, you know, when you do jobs with big characters like that, it's as well as hopefully taking nice pictures. It's quite fascinating to be that close and you know and and listen to them and. Uh, so that that was a good that was a good job. That, that's Charles. We're talking on on Skype, and Skype do a good job these days with backgrounds, choice of backgrounds. But I'm assuming that's not a Skype background. That's a real background, right? Amazing scale electric. It is a real 3D background. It's um it's kind of my well, one of my hobbies in between uh, in between Grand Prix. I um I kind of model my scale electric track, and I race at the uh, the North London Slot Car Club. That that pit lane that that pit lane is supposed to be kind of like uh, it's a, like a hypothetical um, pit lane of champions. So all all the world champions 
figures and cars are in mm. that pit lane. So. And the club that I race at is, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm one of the younger guys there, you know, at 53. So it's, it's not, it's not, it's not really. This, this, it's more of an older, um, older members at the club. But it's there's, there's quite a few, there's quite a few people there, and, and it's, it's good, it's good, it's a good social, it's good competition. You know, it's, it's, it's really good fun. I enjoy it. And what have you got up there in the? Um... The boxes above the scale electric. I see some horses. Do I see some cavalry? Something like that. Uh, there's model figures. You know, well, you know that I'm I'm quite into the the Wild West and the, the Native Americans. So I've I've got quite a big collection. So. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, we spoke at length when you visited the site of the little Bighorn massacre a few years ago, and uh, that meant a lot to you, right? Going to Montana. Yeah, it's. I think it's one of the um, one of the pluses of our job really is that you can kind of combine proper travel with with the Grand Prix so you know sometimes after Australia you know if it was say Malaysia we'd have a week on the beach somewhere or going to Austin you can go out a week early and you know I used to fly to uh, Phoenix and drive over via uh, Tombstone and you know some of the uh, the points of interest you know um, and I've been to the little Bighorn and I don't really know why. Why I've, I've just always been interested in the Native Americans since I was since I was a child, really. Um, and you know, I read a lot of books, and so it's it, it's always a bit sad because I always know what the ending is, and it's always a sad ending, you know. And quite a lot of the things that I'm interested in seem, you know, I'm interested in the natural world and the planet and stuff, and you know, that's might be heading in a slightly depressing direction as well. And and even Formula One to an extent, I, I kind of. I try not to look back, you know, through rose-tinted glasses, but and Formula One is still, I still think, is fantastic. But there are elements of, um, you know, when you look back at the 70s and 80s, which is my kind of growing up period. There's quite a lot of things that I sort of wish could still be the same. You know, mainly the tracks, to be honest. Um, and it was just a bit more free and easy, you know. But um, I'm sure, I'm sure there's still kids. Looking at the drivers today, thinking they're as big a heroes as you know. I thought Nelson Piquet and Alan Prost were, you know. So, when we went back to some of the classic tracks this year, like like Imola, like Turkey, went to Portugal, did they come under the heading of being more free and easy from your point of view? Yeah, definitely. And it was nice. It was nice to hear the drivers um, talking so fondly about. You know, I remember Carlos Sainz at Imola. Uh, saying that it was, you know, the most fun he'd ever had in a in a racing car, you know, and, and it would be nice if Formula One could just maybe sacrifice a little bit of the the cash and kind of go to a few tracks that you know are more pleasing to the eye and certainly better for photographs, you know, um, uh, bring back a few gravel traps and.